In a typical 19th century city, the buildings were not exactly the skyscrapers we associate with cities today. While multi-storied structures were still very much a thing, in many burgeoning towns, a large number of the structures were mostly made of wood. But things were looking up, and the Industrial Age was manifesting rapidly growing cities with ever larger structures to fulfill the need to find places to put their swelling populaces. The sheer mass of people also brought with it an incredible level of noise, as attested by philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, who even wrote an entire enraged treatise on the habit of people cracking whips all day. Then there was the smell, the unbearable, unignorable stench, not only of people living in cramped quarters, but most importantly, of feces scattered throughout the streets. For more on this, you can see our video on our sister channel today. I found out did people in the Middle Ages really throw fecal matter out of their windows? Naturally, this whole situation was not only a hindrance to progress, but also dangerous, as this lack of hygiene caused mass outbreaks of disease in these densely populated areas. So it was in this environment that the citizens of Chicago came up with a rather ingenious, if rather insane sounding idea. They were going to raise the entire city, every building, every road, and all other infrastructure up off the ground and build a sewer system underneath. And why do this instead of perhaps the rather more logical course of simply digging into the earth? Well, to begin with, let's briefly talk about how a typical urban wastewater system actually works. As will come as a shock to absolutely nobody, there are a series of pipes and large sewer mains that ideally always flow downward with the help of gravity until finally they end in a water treatment facility or classically just end up in a large river or body of water. Gravity is the most helpful contributor to this system as pumps often have issues with the unappetizing solids also contained in the wastewater and additionally may accidentally turn the bacteria and chemicals contained within to deadly gases under pressure. Nonetheless, cleverly engineered grinder pumps and lift stations are a necessity in some areas. Still, ideally, narrow household pipes flow downward, collecting in the slowly widening sewer main pipes that follow a course further down, usually underneath streets, and ending in low-lying wastewater treatment plants. For much, much, much more on this, you can see our surprisingly fascinating video on Today I Found Out, so what happens after you flush? In any event, this all brings up the question of what if there isn't a way down at all, and pumping everything upwards is simply not feasible? All right, so this brings us back to 19th century Chicago. The issue with Chicago, among other things, is that it wasn't exactly well planned out by the early prospectors and investors in property in the region. Being only a few feet higher than the local waterways in Lake Michigan, essentially the city was built on a swamp. And with no elevation to speak of within the city, there was just nowhere for wastewater to go. The resulting muck is no joke, especially if you and an entire city's worth of people wade through it every single day. Industry certainly had its part in producing waste, but horses as the most common means of transport and the growing population who had no way of getting rid of natural waste and garbage as it wasn't collected and who therefore dumped an awful lot of it on the streets certainly didn't help either. And unlike in many other cities, this lovely wastewater didn't run off with the latest rains, but rather it just lingered there. This created a lovely layer of mud that even raised wooden walkways couldn't fix. Especially as with all the moisture and less appetizing properties of the water, the wood tended to rot rather quickly. To illustrate the state of things, a contemporary Chicago joke was, a man walking down the street discovers another traveler buried up to his shoulders in mud on the road. The man asks the traveler, do you need help? No, thank you. The traveler replies, I have a good horse under me. As can be expected in this environment, disease was rampant. There were common issues with dysentery, typhoid, and cholera, with outbreak after outbreak coming on the backs of one another. For example, in 1855 alone, one in every 16 people in the city was killed by cholera. Needless to say, things had to change. There remains, however, the issue of being located in a place already close to the water level. Digging an efficient sewer system in 1850s Chicago was simply not possible with the water level where it was. There just wasn't anywhere to go downwards. More importantly, there was the very real danger of polluting the lake even more than it already was, and therefore the drinking water supply. In short, gravity simply wasn't working in anybody's favor. So, enter Ellis Chesperer of Boston, who was commissioned to deal with the issue. The solution he and others decided upon was to build upwards instead of down, and then have the wastewater flow into the Mississippi and away from Chicago. Out of sight, out of mind, at least for everyone upriver, for 
those downriver, well, it's just a different story, isn't it? Don't worry about them. As for Chicago, the plan was outlined by the Chicago Board of Sewage Commissioners in 1855, and a literally groundbreaking new ordinance was passed. Affected areas of the city, meaning downtown Chicago and neighborhoods by the river, would be raised between 4 and 14 feet as needed in a given section. This would increase the distance between the streets and water level and allow for the creation of an extensive sewer system underneath the new ground level. And so it was that starting in 1858, buildings, even weighing several hundred tons, were one by one raised. But at the same time, sewers were built underneath, and new roads and sidewalks were erected on the level of the houses. To further aid in the whole process, the canal was dredged to reverse the flow of the river, which simultaneously freed up massive amounts of material that was then used to raise street levels. As can be expected, the undertaking required a bit of innovation. And Sir George Pullman, one of many new house movers and lifters. Pullman is credited for bringing the essential techniques of using railroad jacks for lifting the large buildings of Chicago. These jacks had previously been used at the Erie Canal and to lift train cars off their tracks, and it was exactly the technique that the city had been waiting for. Affixing a great number of jack screws in combination with rails beneath the buildings, hundreds of people could simultaneously turn the screws slowly and consistently raising entire buildings without damaging the structures themselves. For an idea of the peak scale here, the biggest such lift was executed in 1868, taking 600 men who were respectively in charge of 10 jack screws each, bringing the number up to 6,000 beneath the buildings in an entire block that was slated to be lifted. When it was time to do a particular lift, a signal was given, and every one of these jacks had their screws turned by one notch so that everything remained level overall in the block. The repetition of this process very, very slowly raised the buildings over the course of four days, with the houses then elevated, temporary timbers were placed underneath until new foundations were laid. After this, all that remained was the slow descent of the houses onto these higher foundations. Now, you might be thinking this probably interrupted day-to-day -day life in these buildings, but that actually usually wasn't the case. For example, there are stories of guests at the Tremont Hotel sleeping in their beds while the work was done, remaining undisturbed and just waking up a few feet higher above the original ground level than when they went to sleep. An entire block on Lake Street, a notably wealthy district, was even moved up all at once, as was Briggs House, with people doing their jobs and living their lives inside uninterrupted. As you might imagine, raising every building in the city wasn't exactly something that could be done overnight, and it turns out that raising the entire city ultimately took about two full decades. But it worked out in the city's favor, as the insane idea and execution also proved an effective tourist attraction. To quote Donald Miller in his History of Chicago, City of the Century, the process of hoisting huge buildings proved endlessly fascinating to visitors and Chicagoans alike. People would gather in the streets by the hundreds to watch four- and five-story buildings and entire city blocks at a time, including horse car tracks tracks, lampposts, hydrants, and even shade trees raised as high as 12 feet. On top of simply raising buildings, some also took the opportunity to move their building to an entirely different location via simply digging up the building, putting it on logs or the like, and rolling it somewhere else because, I guess, well, why not? In 1968, David McRae, a Scottish traveler visiting Chicago, described it as follows. Never a day passed during my stay in the city that I did not meet one or more houses shifting their quarters. One day, I met nine going out Great Madison Street in the horse cars. We had to stop twice to let houses get across. On this note, those who could afford it sometimes simply moved their buildings to higher areas of the city. And adapting to the general glow up the city was receiving during this time of industry, others started working with stone rather than wood, creating better-looking, more durable buildings. As can be expected, however, some disparity remained, and it all had to do with wealth. James Sterling, a visitor to Chicago in 1857, stated, When you walk along even the principal streets, you pass perhaps a block of fine stone-built stores with a good granite pavement in front, and a few steps on you descend three or four wooden steps to the old level of the street and find a wooden pavement in front of low, shabby-looking wooden houses. The poorer population who simply could not afford to raise their homes had to approach the changing circumstances in a different manner. Instead of shouldering the enormous costs of changing the entire layout of their residences or moving it elsewhere, they often just built new doors and staircases that allowed them to access the higher levels of the streets, effectively burying the lower parts of the home in the process. This created bi-level houses, which can still be found in the Chicago South and West Side and in areas of Fullerton, all areas that remained untouched by the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. In other parts of the city, this devastating fire destroyed many houses, which in turn allowed new ones to be built on the rubble and therefore also on the desired level. 
In the end, after the completion of the raising of the entire city between about 4 and 14 feet, Chicago ended up with one of America's first comprehensive storm and wastewater systems, proving yet again that when we humans pool our brain power and efforts, even the of situations are always solvable, even if we have to think a little bit outside the box to be able to do it. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.